I have had the pleasure to be joined by Joshua Cohen. He is a political philosopher who has taught at Stanford and MIT. He is now part of the faculty of uh, Apple University and the University of California, Berkeley. And he is also the editor of the magazine, Boston Review. How are you doing, Correct. Josh? Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you, uh, Tron. So nice to meet you. Yes, it's nice meeting you too. Uh, before we begin on our main topic of discussion, you've uh, even <clears throat> saying that you've lectured on uh, Glenn Gould at Toronto, and would you mind telling me what that uh, particular lecture was about? Oh, I wouldn't uh, mind at all. Thanks for asking. Yes, I uh, developed a class about, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, Glenn Gould at Apple. It's a three-hour class. Um, and it's about uh, Glenn Gould's re-recording in 1982 of his signature work, Box, the recording of Box Goldberg Variations, which was also his first uh, uh, recording. So it was really his first and last uh, recording. And <clears throat> the two recordings are very different. And I was trying to understand and explain to people why he might have re-recorded this, uh, uh, this work that he had started his uh, career with. And the basic uh, idea was, I, I think the Gould was, um, had a kind of ethical inspiration uh, in his performance. Uh, uh, Gould thought that uh, great musical performance aims to provide people with an experience of ecstasy and uh, ecstasy, but by ecstasy, um, he meant an, an experience of uh, standing outside or at some distance from the world. Uh, that's what the, the word, the Greek word ecstasis uh, means, standing outside. And the aim in his uh, musical performance, and in particular in this re recording of the Goldberg Variations, was to try to trans uh, translate that. Um, animating idea, that, that very abstract idea of providing people with an experience of ecstasy, of standing at, dis at a distance from the world, and uh, translate that into a set of performance uh, decisions. And so the uh, presentation is about how the performance decisions in playing uh, uh, the both the ways he played the harmonies and the ways he played the counterpoint in the 1982 recording of the Goldberg Variations, where you could understand these uh, performance decisions as inspired or animated by the idea of creating a performance that would give listeners this um, import, really important experience of standing at a distance from the world. And th that required <clears throat> a performance that had a, a sufficiently kind of integrated architecture that you could kind of live inside the music while it was being uh, uh, performed. And that, had, that, that led to a set of decisions about which repeats uh, he played in uh, the 1982 recording, and also um, uh, decisions about the tempo, uh, the tempi, really the different tempi at, at which he played the different variations to create this kind of, as I say, as I described it, a kind of integrated architecture so that while you're listening to the music, it wasn't a, a series of, you know, striking moments, but uh, at this integrated whole. Um, that, that, that's what it's uh, about if you want a couple more hours on that, I, it's, uh, I, I can, love the. We can definitely, um, we can definitely yeah. spend a lot more time on it. But uh, I'm yeah. going to try to forge a bridge between uh, Glenn Gould and what we, the main topic of our discussion today. Um, so this going to be this going to sound very clumsy, but Glenn Gould is a famous Canadian musician. Another famous Canadian musician is Leonard Cohen, and. Uh, this year celebrates the 30th anniversary of one of his uh, signature, very much political song, uh, Democracy, uh, with that lyrics, um, from the war against disorder, from the sirens night and day, 
from the fires of the homeless, from the ashes of the gay, democracy is coming to the USA. Um, I'm going to try if uh, we can uh, we can you know link that discussion to into whatever we talk about in the next uh, few minutes. But um, but uh, Bill Clinton in 1999 uh, he spoke of this one particular philosopher. Um, he says he is he is perhaps the greatest political philosopher of the 20th century. And he has helped a whole generation of learned, learned Americans revive their faith in democracy itself. And he also awarded this particular philosopher the National Humanities Medal. That, <clears throat> that philosopher is, uh, happens to be your teacher, John Ross. Yeah. Yeah, and right. uh, before getting into Mr. Ross's ideas, I would like to hear your thoughts on and experience on how he was as a teacher. Because I, I heard a story in which uh, Mr. Ross, he stood in front of uh, direct sunlight because he didn't want a student to present her thesis uh, obstructed by anything. And Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that story is apocryphal, or, but it could be true. Um, he was... Uh, as a person, he was uh, an extremely uh, generous, decent uh, person, kind of animated by uh, respect for the students he worked with, um, uh, took them seriously as uh, collaborators, as co not that he was writing things with them, but as co-investigators in the uh, very important issues about the nature of justice and uh, morality. Uh, so he, he treated people as equals um, and, uh, and, uh, and that, that meant uh, he had an unusually, for somebody of his generation, unusually large number of women students as well as men students, advised uh, many of the leading uh, figures in moral and political philosophy in the next uh, uh, generation or two generations of uh, people in philosophy. Um, but it was really it was really that sense of respect that um, people got from him. You know, I, I, when I was, a, <clears throat> uh, and it, it was, it was partly how he treated you, but it was also how he treated the material that he was teaching. Cause you were asking not just how he was as an advisor, but also how he was as a teacher. Yeah. And he, he uh, conveyed um, a sense about the incredible importance of the material that he was teaching, not self-importance, I mean, he took his own work very seriously. I mean, when he taught an introduction to political philosophy, he would teach Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Marx and Mill, and he would teach Rawls in the course. Mm. So he understood that he was doing, you know, serious and important work. Uh, so there wasn't a false sense of uh, modesty, but it, he, you came away feeling that the issues that you were studying, the texts that you were studying, the ideas that you were studying were not a game. They were really very, very serious. And in, in um, I took a course from uh, Rawls in my first year in uh, graduate school, in the spring of my first year in graduate school. So I was 22 years old at the time. And it was a, a, a seminar on Kant's moral philosophy. And we read all the fundamental texts of Kant's moral philosophy. And one day I, I, I we had the seminar and I came home and uh, he calls me um, and, you know, this is John Rawls. He published this great book, A Theory of Justice that Bill Clinton was celebrating. And here I am, I'm a first year PhD student, I'm 22 years old. And he calls and he says, um, you know, he was calling about how the class had gone that day and he wanted to know if it was okay. And, um, I didn't think he was calling me because he wanted to make me feel good. Um, I think he was calling because he really 
thought the material that he was teaching, this Kant's moral philosophy, was incredibly important. And he wanted to make sure that he had conveyed the idea as well, that he had succeeded in teaching it. So uh, he was a remarkable person, in short. Right. Um, so just as a side, I, I've had uh, Harvey Mansfield as a guest on this podcast before. Oh, yeah. Um, he is also a political philosopher, a great one, yeah. in my opinion. Um, yeah. I've asked him this question, and I think I'm going to pass this on to you. Um, imagine yourself, and I believe that you've done this before, uh, in a lecture hall full of first-year undergraduates, and they are all signed up for political philosophy, but you know they've had an interest in what the subject entails, but they've They've heard of maybe one or two thinkers, but they have not, you know, read into them a lot. So how how would you introduce uh, the subject of polo- political philosophy to them, like as in uh, convincing them that why the subject matters? And I would be interested in how Ross would answer that question as well. So um, uh, the way I think about political philosophy is uh, I, I, there are many ways to think about it. And I don't want to claim that this is the right way, but just I'm explaining how I think about the subject. Um, I, I think of it as the exploration of a set of fundamental uh, ideas of political morality. Um, that shape how people think and ought to think about political life, about the collective political life and the exercise of power. Um, So I don't think of it as an exploration so much of the concept of politics or law or of the state. It's it's much more um, normative. It's about the political values and political uh, ideas of political morality. And and by that, I mean, uh, in particular, ideas about uh, justice and uh, rightness in uh, politics. And what I try to do is convey to students that studying political philosophy is not so much an opportunity to study other people's ideas about those issues. The perspective that you should take in political philosophy is not the perspective of an observer or a judge. It's very much more an opportunity for you, the student, to reflect on the the, uh, ideas that you have, the ideas of political morality, of justice, of rightness, that you have that shape your thinking and to judge whether or not the ideas that you have on reflection are the most reasonable uh, ideas to have. Uh, so I make it, it's personal in a way. Um, it's, uh, and it's practical because those ideas shape your conduct. Um, and and that's what makes them, I think that's what makes them uh, important. So that, that's how I think about the subject. And I think Rawls um, thought about it in, in a similar way. It's a reflection on a set of fundamental uh, pra- ideas that have a practical character to them, practical in the sense that they guide your thinking and acting, uh, high level guidance to your thinking and acting about what's right in the uh, collective uh, uh, activity that we call uh, politics. I I hope that makes sense. Uh, That's uh, that's how I... No, it's uh, definitely worth thinking about. So uh, let's move on to John Ross. Um, yeah. and, and that, by yeah. the way, if I can just add one thing, that's a, la- a bridge between how I think about Glenn Gould's musical oh. performance and how I think, of, because Gould's musical performance was not just, um, you know, this, you know, remark. He it wasn't only remarkably technically gifted and brilliant, but his musical performance was animated by uh, an ethical idea—the idea of bringing to each listener 
this great uh, experience, uh, this important human experience of uh, ecstasy. So it's about explore, exposing and exploring and reflecting on the values that uh, animated his work. And then I think of political philosophy in a similar spirit. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was thinking quite the same thing in that I I find that the the kind of art that resonates with me the most is, is the kind that when the author, while not trying to be preachy, still managed to manifest his or her most cherished values and make them beautiful and artful. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, that's that I believe motivated Glenn Wu, that I believe motivated Leonard Cohen, and of course, yeah. John Ross, who was, you know, not an artist, but a philosopher. Yeah. He was born in 1921. And in his uh, 50th year of life, uh, 1971, he published a monumental text that we are all studying, analyzing, debating to this day, A Theory of Justice. Yes. So um, I first learned of uh, John Rawls through attending, well, virtually, uh, Michael Sandel's uh, course on justice. Yeah. And even though, of course, we'll get into Sandel's criticism of Rawls uh, later on, but he made a really good point um, stressing how important that work is and how Rawls's main thesis is to reconcile the notion of uh, liberty as defined by the Anglo-American tradition and equality, not just formal equality, but economic equality. I believe yeah. that's my reading of it, to say the least. Um, yeah. So perhaps um, perhaps we can discuss some of his ideas first. But um, I would like to I like to ask about the veil of ignorance. That is what uh, that is the original position that Rawls uh, devised. I know that Hobbes, uh, Thomas Hobbes, defined it as a state of nature, and Rousseau sort of defined it as a much more Edenic place. But what what is Rawls' original position? Uh, I'd like to to elaborate on that. The veil of ignorance, so to speak. Yes. So the aim in the uh, book, A Theory of Justice, is to propose, to explain, to justify uh, principles of justice, um, standards that, uh, he, that Rawls thought people could, reasonable people could agree on as the highest level principles to guide their cooperation in a democratic society. And uh, he has two principles of justice, and we can talk more later on about the principles, as a, but very roughly speaking, there's a principle of equal basic liberties, and then a, a principle that uh, requires a certain kind of equal opportunity, and that restricts the um, extent of inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth. So he develops, he explains those principles um, and their implications, but then the quest, the large question of in a theory of justice is why these principles? What's the justification for them? What are the reasons for them? And the way he justifies them is that he uh, revives, and it was a revival, the idea of of a social compact or social contract that, as you say, you find in the tradition or tradition of political philosophy, including in Hobbes and in John Locke and in, uh, in Jean-Jacques Rousseau and in Kant as well. Uh, though the idea of a social contract or social compact is a justification for a certain type of political society had fallen out of favor. So roles as so I say, revives it, I think particularly influenced by Rousseau, a reading of Rousseau. And uh, so the idea is to justify the principles by, by arguing that they would be, these principles, these standards of justice, the ones that I mentioned, would be agreed to by people uh, in a situation that's designed for the purpose of assessing principles of justice. Now, uh, it's a complicated setup, what that situation is, what, where you make the social contract, but a key idea 
is the idea, uh, as you said, of the veil of ignorance. So you make it in what he calls the original position, that's the contract situation. And the, a key defining feature of the original position is uh, that uh, the, this idea of a veil of ignorance. And a veil of ignorance is that you're supposed to reason reflect on, reason about what the requirements of justice are on the assumption that you don't know all kinds of things about yourself. You don't know whether you're rich or poor. You don't know whether you're a man or a woman. You don't know if you have religious convictions and or what those religious convictions are. You don't know what your fundamental values are. So you put all of those features behind the veil of ignorance, meaning you reason without any reference to them as if you didn't know them. And the idea, to put it more positively, the idea is that all you know about yourself and all that the other participants know about themselves is fundamentally that they are free and equal moral persons. So it's a way of justifying principles of justice that emphasizes certain fundamental, morally salient commonalities among people and puts the differences between and among people uh, to the side, puts them to the side specifically for the purpose of working out what the right principles of justice are. Of course, those differentiating features, features of our your identity or my identity or our, as I said, religious tradition or social position or gender or race. To, those may be very, very important to us in making decisions about how we're going to conduct, how I or you or some person is going to conduct their life. But this is about how we are going to conduct our common life. And for the purposes of that, Rawls thinks that the salient feature is that we are share these qualities of being free and equal moral persons and not those differences between and among us. That's the sort of main idea right. of uh, the original position. Gotcha. So uh, another one of Ross's ideas, uh, if, I, if I get it correctly, uh, is that he accepts that because of uh, political liberty and economic liberty, uh, some people are going to end up richer than others, perhaps vastly so. Um, but he he conceded that, but he, he he theorizes or he proposes that any and all inequalities must be made somehow to benefit the, the poorest amongst us. Yeah. And of course, uh, it runs into the, of course, the libertarians uh, have a proposed a critique of it, which is something that I kind of subscribe to because uh, usually economic libertarians would say that, well, um, econo economic inequality and a, a society in which uh, people are economically unequal, as in someone is making more, more even vast, vastly more money than, than someone else, does not make it necessarily unjust. And any and all attempt to sort of like uh, equalize the, the income distribution would end up, you know, giving states, the state more power. I've yeah. recently, I recently finished uh, Thomas Sowell's book, uh, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, in which uh, he put Ross's ideas to a critical lens. And I remember one of his quotes as uh, saying, well, if Ross is correct, then imagine a policy that uh, benefits millions of people in the middle class. But yeah. that policy, while beneficial, remains unjust because it doesn't benefit the poorest amongst us. So how would, uh, how would Ross or you respond to that? Yeah. So the uh, w wonderful question, uh, the I mentioned before uh, that Rawls has these two principles of justice. There's an equal basic liberty principle, and then there's this principle about opportunity and, and uh, distributive fairness. 
And the principle about distributive fairness, which he called the difference principle, says that um, inequality are permissible from the point of justice, from the point of view of justice, um, if and only if uh, they uh, contribute maximally uh, to the benefit of the least advantaged. And by least, the, the, there's a complicated story here about what he means by least advantage, but a, a way to think about it operationally speaking is he's thinking of the least advantaged social group as say the group that's at the bottom quintile of the income distribution, say the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Um, and uh, so the um, thought uh, behind the veil, the, if you're choosing principles behind the veil of ignorance in the original position, you don't know whether you're going to be, at, whether you're rich or poor, uh, you regard yourself as a free and equal member of the society. Um, and what you are concerned about is making sure that your situation is going to be, roughly speaking, as good as it can be, no matter where you end up. So you could end up at the top, you could end up at the bottom. You're particularly concerned in the original position behind the veil of ignorance of making sure that if you end up in that least advantaged group, say the bottom quintile in the income distribution, your situation is still pretty good. Uh, pretty good, you know, meaning that uh, you want some liberties, a political liberty and religious liberty, et cetera. And you also want a share of resources of economic resources, of income and wealth, that enables you to make something of those liberties, to make something of your life. There's a Rawls talks about the worth of liberty, and the worth of liberty is depend is the value of the liberties to you, and the value of the liberties to you depends on what you're able to do with them, and that depends on the resources that you have at your uh, disposal. And so the, the way Rawls describes this is if you put these principles together, that liberty principle. And then the difference principle, what, you're, what they do together is they say that what you're trying to do is to maximize the worth of liberty to the least advantaged group. Now, uh, so you do have, from the point of view of justice, a singular focus on that least advantaged group. You're not focused on the most advantaged group. Well, they're already the most advantaged. And you're not focused, you're not trying, as is often said in American politics, you're not trying to maximize for the middle class, which is where the uh, where uh, Thomas Sowell's uh, point comes into play. Um, and I think the way Rawls was thinking about this was, um, suppose there's some policy some you know, tax policy and uh, some rules of the economic game. And if you make that policy, you can do really, really well for the middle class, uh, but there's no gain for people who are in the least advantaged position. How is that, how is that possible? Why is it that I need to understand, not just as an abstract theoretical possibility, but as a real social possibility, how could it be that there's no way that people who are in the least advantaged position, the least advantaged in a society of equals, people who are equally important, whose lives matter equally, and they're the most disadvantaged, and there's no way of trying to ensure that they do better, that some, for some reason, I don't know how it's possible even, all of the advantage has to go to the middle class. Well, I, I don't get how that's possible. And then the thought is that if you can uh, re you know, distribute, ensure a distribution in which the least advantage do better, those are the members of the society of equals who uh, are, who, who, to whom 
who aren't getting the attention that they're entitled to, the worth of their liberty, what they're able to do with their lives is less than it is the least among us and less than it could be if we did things a little differently. That's the, so I don't know what kind of example uh, Thomas Sowell has in, in mind where somehow you have to give the benefits exclusively to the middle class, you can't do anything else with them. But I, um, I'd like to hear more about how that's what he's thinking about. Um, well, I, I, I'm sure that Thomas Sowell can articulate his argument better in the book. I mean, the quest for cosmic I'm justice. Sure. He's a brilliant thinker. Yeah, of course he is. Um, to defend him a bit, I would say that, you know, well, uh, he's, he critiques the notion that any and all policy can, you know, exclusively benefits the least advantage, he says. I believe that sure that you know a policy that can benefit the the most amounts of people without benefiting the least advantage would be in a, in all beneficial and he would say just so <clears throat> that's that's at least my understanding of his argument. But to uh, to add to your point, um, as an observer of American politics, I find that yeah. increasingly well, maybe up until the election of Trump, um, from the 80s onwards, uh, the focus has always been appealing to the middle class, both in the Republican and uh, Democratic yeah. side. <clears throat> Perhaps the idea is that they have, they have both the sufficient economic and political powers uh, so that their votes can matter, that their opinions can be informed enough. Or you cannot really appeal to the rich because the majority of Americans are not that rich, but they fail to appeal to the poor working class because, well, either they are not well informed enough or they lack the economic and political power. And just to get it a bit personal, my my father, who was a nutritionist, he has he had a chance to visit uh, the United States um, maybe a few years ago. He visited the East Coast, so cities like uh, DC and Baltimore and mm -hmm. New York. Of course, as a nutritionist, he had, he had plenty to say about how the American diet is uh, insufficient. But as an observer of the American life, he, he believes that um, American society is uh, it's very free, perhaps even too licentious. Uh, yeah. And and he he observed that in a particular Baltimore neighborhood, where as soon as he moves out the sort of like the well-off neighborhood, he comes into this absolute, you know, <clears throat> absolute poverty, and where people you know cannot live sufficiently, and yeah. it sort of like haunted him, and it it gave him a really bad impression of the U.S. Um, yeah. Although, um, so for, for my money, uh, even though I have not been to the U.S., I, I say that I've read enough stories about how this is, a, this is actually a miracle in, in the U.S. that is hardly replicated anywhere else, is that people, even though they are born poor, tend not to stay poor. And, of course, there's that... Um, there's that American dream, which many view as a cliche that uh, if you work hard, if you stick to the stage straight and narrow and conservatives would ask, would add that if you are a religious person and if you follow the nuclear family structure and such, you would inevitably become, uh, land yourself in the middle class within or, you know, within your lifetime or within your children's lifetime. And if, if the trajectory continues, your children can be part of the 1%. And that, that is what Thomas Sowell says about the 1% too, is that they tend not to be fixed, that population. The, not everyone stays in that 1% bracket for ever, for, for generations. And the same goes to the poor. No one stays poor for, for generations at a time. So, yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, I, I hope you come to the, the 
country, sometimes to the United States sometime. Uh, we'd be, if you come to San Francisco, I'd be happy to show you around and spend some uh, time with you. It'd be lovely to see much. you here. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, uh, one of the things that's very striking um, about uh, the United States is that there's much less upward mobility than people think there is, um, and much less than there is in other countries. So there are these cross-national studies of how much social mobility there is, both upward mobility and downward mobility. And the thing that's unusual about the United States, it's very striking, is you know, if you compare it to, you know, Sweden or Britain, uh, for that matter, mm -hmm. um, or uh, Germany, or, uh, first of all, there's less uh, upward mobility uh, than in the United States and then in those other countries. In addition, in the United States, people believe that there's more upward mobility than there actually is. Whereas in those other countries, people believe that there's less upward mobility than there actually is. Wow. Yeah, it's a, I, there are, I, I can send you some things on this. Some, I, this is, a, I think, a pretty well, I mean, social science is not particle physics and people find things, you know, people discover something and then it changes. But I think it's pretty well uh, agreed but that there is uh, less upward mobility. And then there's this peculiar um, lack of understanding or misunderstanding uh, that in the United States, the United States is unique in these studies and being a place where people think there's more than there actually is versus the other places they think there's less than there. They think their class structures are much more uh, rigid. So it's, um, and, and part of the reason for that is that there's so much inequality in the United States and there is an association between how much inequality there is and how much social mobility there is in countries. This is something, uh, there's some dispute about this because there's dispute about it. It's, it's uh, right, it's called the Great Gatsby Curve. Yes. The Great Gatsby Curve shows the relationship, um, you know, after the novel Great Gatsby, um, mm -hmm. Uh, that shows the relationship between how much inequality there is in a place and how much social mobility there is in a place. And the more inequality there is, the less uh, uh, mobility uh, there is. So uh, the, the stories about the United States are a bit of a myth. Now, when you talk about an issue like this in the United States, and uh, this is something, of course, that Thomas Sowell knows uh, well, and. Uh, I'm sure he has some, you know, different opinions about these issues, but I, is, it's um, uh, how much upward mobility there is, how much social mobility there is, really, uh, there's a very uh, striking uh, racial difference. So if you're born, this is about downward mobility, but it's, it's important also, if you're born into the top quintile of the income distribution in the United States. Your family is in the top 20%, uh, and you're white, then you have about a 40% chance of staying in the top quintile. This isn't the 1%, this is just the top 20%. I don't know what the number is for 1%, um, but top 20%, you're born, you're white, 40%, roughly 40% chance of staying in the top quintile. If you're, and there's a very small, pretty small chance, less than 10%, maybe it's about 8% chance that you fall to the bottom quintile. So chances of falling up, okay. If you're black and you're born in the top quintile of the income distribution, you have about an equal chance of staying in the top quintile or falling to the bottom quintile. Mm -hmm. So the, those, um, the experiences that people have in the United States of intergenerational mobility are very, very different uh, depending, on, uh, depending on race. 
Wow. So uh, another stream of criticism of uh, Ross's philosophy yeah. is, uh, again, I've mentioned Michael Sandel, but yeah. he, mm, uh, he wrote a book called, if I can remember the name, uh, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice. And yeah. Yeah. his and a bunch of other people are known as communitarians, even though Sandel himself would dispute that title. Um, he believes that Rawls's idea of justice, uh, uh, was it places or depicts individuals as what he called unencumbered selves, and he believes yeah. that the uh, individuals without attachments to uh, their religious beliefs or their family structure or their culture yeah. or certain traditions within their cultures. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's not really a fully formed individual. And yeah, I find sure. it, it's a very surprising line of criticism because, uh, of course, Ross, in his theory of justice, he, he, he sort of like accepted, accepts as granted that people have these uh, certain uh, encumbers. And yeah, so how, how, would you, how would you perceive uh, Sandel's criticism, which... Uh, this, uh, this is something that I've just realized that maybe that's why he's a, a really popular in uh, East Asia, uh, like Japan and yeah. even Vietnam. Uh, I've yeah. seen translations of his works in yeah. my country as well, because uh, Asia, East Asia especially, tend to be more community and family and tradition oriented. Yeah. So there's that. Yes. yes. So first of all, you're very fortunate to have uh, had a chance to take his course online. I, I know Michael Sandel pretty well. I haven't seen him for a while, but we used to, we used to hang around together some. And he is an incredible teacher. I mean, he's a yes. brilliant uh, teacher. Um, um, and has been a, you know, an important contributor to public uh, discussion. The book that you mentioned, was, it was his first book. It was actually based on his PhD thesis. I think it was published in 1982, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice. And uh, he does, as you rightly say, um, he uh, says that the Rawls has this model of this, the, as, as he describes it, he's a, you know, he's a gifted writer also, a model of the unencumbered self, a self that's shorn of, stripped of all uh, values and attachments and relationships, a kind of pure individual. individual. And uh, um, I, I think it's, um, I think there's an interesting set of issues there, but I think the way the criticism is presented is quite misguided uh, about what Rawls is doing. So go, let me go back. Let's go back to the the uh, what we talked about earlier about the veil of ignorance, mm -hmm. the original position in the veil of ignorance. <clears throat> and as I said, Rawls's idea of the veil of ignorance is you put all of these uh, features of yourself, including your religious convictions and uh, your fundamental values, you put them behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, and so all that you're re relying on when you're thinking about the problem of justice for the society, for your society, for our, for our it's a, we, for our, we're trying to figure out principles for our society, uh, uh, all that you rely on is that you, like the other participants, are free and equal moral persons. Um, uh, and that means moral persons means that you have the capacity to form goals and attachments, final you know values, your fundamental convictions, and that you have the capacity to have a, for a sense of justice, for a sense of right and wrong, and a capacity to act on that sense of justice. That's the kind of thing that you know about yourself, and everybody knows that about themselves. So you're focusing on what's common. Now, why are you doing that? Well, there's a very nice phrase uh, that Rawls uh, uses in some places where he talks about the original, what you're doing in the original position. It's a model for reasoning. 
And what he says is you, you are modeling irrelevance through ignorance. What does that mean? What it means is the fundamental idea that he has in the, with the original position is that those, those qualities, those characteristics, those features that distinguish the free and equal members of uh, society are not what's relevant when you're deciding on the fundamental principles of cooperation, the principles of justice for the society. Those features, people have them. They got them, as you said. <laughs> people have them. It's not like they, are, they exist without them. People have them. There are lots of things that are true about people. What Rawls is concerned about is which of those characteristics, those qualities of people, are the ones that are relevant for the purpose of deciding on principles of justice for the society. He thinks it's the, those shared characteristics of being free and equal moral persons and those other characteristics like your religious convictions, for example. People disagree about those. He's thinking that those are not the the, the appropriate basis for deciding on the standards of cooperation that we're with for, for us. So just to go back to, to, on the point that I completely agree with the point that you made in reference to Michael Sandel, that he presents Rawls as thinking that you have these unencumbered selves. Well, no, 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 no. People have all those characteristics. The hmm. issue is which ones are relevant and which ones are irrelevant for the purposes of principles of justice? Wow, yes. Um, when I'm, so when I listen to you, I've been thinking about how in America, in America, people, well, uh, I, I know that in Vietnam, there's still like a device between um, classes um, and even ethnic too. Um, there are like, uh, there are like dozens of ethnic minorities in Vietnam, but you, you wouldn't know that unless you actually come here and you learn about it. Um, and in America, it, the focus, the political, the focus of much political discourse is not much on class these days. I mean, if it is on class, then again, it's the middle class until Trump, yeah. when he pretends to care about the, the poor and working class. Yeah. But it's a lot, it's a lot more about race, especially, uh, black and white relations. I don't know if you've uh, seen that uh, very, very not funny John Stewart monologue about like the problem with white people. I, 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 but nevertheless, um, as an observer of American politics from afar, I, I can see that there is a lot of class elements uh, um, was lying beneath. Um, I, I believe the reason why uh, there's still the there's still such tension between the black and white races is that, um, well, I don't know if this is a matter of perception or reality. Uh, maybe you can uh, enlighten me on this one, but it, it seems that based on my observations that um, the, a good amount of black people in the United States have not had uh, sufficient or satisfactory economic power I know that there's a black middle class and there's the black upper class. Uh, yes. They are perhaps perhaps uh, overly represented, but again, like as my father who visited Baltimore knows that there is a huge black underclass. Yes. Yeah. Or the black poor. Um, and so that, that lies the tension behind the black and white relations. Um, you know, I've... Um, He's a, although he's a controversial thinker, I think he's quite brilliant. Uh, Charles Murray in his book, uh, Losing Ground, he, he argues that the reason why uh, black people have not, I guess, uh, overcome to use uh, their term is that the post uh, Johnson era of great society uh, welfare programs have not, um, have uh, basically, what is it? Um, have formed, uh, well, I should be very careful in saying this, but have enabled certain habits or yeah. tendencies or lifestyles uh, that 
that kept um, certain members of the black community in uh, in the um, poor income strata. And one of that he mentions is uh, single motherhood. But I, I imagine that I imagine that people who are liberal, who are on the liberal side of Murray would find that quite disagreeable. <clears throat> and so my question to you is that, um, uh, do you think that the, the racial tension in the US can be fixed or at least improve or, you know, um, or thought just a bit when black people um, have received uh, enough political power or even economic equality? And if so, how can that yeah. happen? Um, so it, it, it's an important and, uh, as you've uh, alluded to, uh, you know, very complicated set of questions. I do part of what you're saying, which I very much agree with, mm -hmm. is um, that. Uh, uh, the United States is, as I said, a very unequal place. I mean, the level of economic inequality in the United States is uh, gross. It's uh, you know higher than it's been for a hundred years, and and not just income inequality, wealth inequality uh, as well. Um, um, and uh, so the idea that um, you know, it's one big middle class and you should focus on the middle class. Well, this is kind of, it's sort of delusional. I, I don't think that, now, I agree with what you're saying, that that is where the focus has been in political discourse uh, for the past, you know, 40 years, uh, um, as, you know, how to do well by the middle class. And uh um, but I, I think it obscure for middle class covers a great deal. It obscures uh, a lot of the fundamental differences in people's experiences of where they live and what kind of jobs they have and how secure those jobs are and how secure their income is and what kind of housing they're in. There are fundamental class inequalities in the United States. Then in addition to that, it's very hard uh, in the United States to disentangle issues of uh, race and class, because um, uh, if you look at uh, 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 black wealth, it's a small fraction of white wealth. If you look at uh, black income, it's pretty stably about 60% of white income. If you look at experiences of inter generationally, as I said before, there are fundamental racial differences in uh, intergenerational mobility. If you look at experiences of incarceration, fundamental differences. In the United States, it's an extreme uh, in, in having people in prison, white and black, uh, but the rate of incarceration for black Americans is very high. So, th so there are um, and if you try to separate out which aspects of uh, race of the uh, race in the United States are about class or about economic inequality, and which are not, it's very hard to it's very hard to separate them uh, to separate them out. But I I think I don't expect this. Uh, to happen soon because the politics in the United States is in such a, a, a bad way. Um, but I do think that there needs to be some kind of, uh, you know, what some people have called a third reconstruction. The first reconstruction was after the Civil War. Second reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, which had a transformative impact on uh, Black political participation, particularly in the South. Uh, and that the third reconstruction uh, needs to address uh, the uh, fundamental issues about economic inequality that were never addressed by the first and second uh, reconstructions. Um, it's uncontroversial about the first reconstruction, the second reconstruction and civil rights movement. It's uh, 
there were there were some improvements in uh, uh, the creation of a black middle class and uh, improvements in uh, home ownership, improvements in employment, et cetera, improvements in schooling. Uh, and those had partly to do with the civil rights movement, but also had to do with the tightness of the labor market in the 1950s and 1960s in the United States. But there never really was a fundamental, has been a fundamental redress of these basic issues about economic um, uh, disparity. And I think that those have to be addressed. And I think, I think that they're best addressed by, uh, by a politics that's, uh, for, that you know takes the race race issue seriously, but has a more universalistic uh, class uh, quality uh, to it, um, where you build coalitions, uh, black white coalitions, and they're at black white and brown, and there is uh, some of that. But it's it's the, the the general state of politics in the United States is it's in such a uh, unfortunate way that I don't. Mm -hmm see, in, not in the near term anyway, I don't see a lot of uh, forward motion on these issues. Yeah, I, I was hoping, uh, I think uh, during Obama's administration, I was hoping that he would, he would you know, be the one to at least uh, improve race relations. At least we would come up with that kind of politics, but it, it, it would appear that, you know, he failed in doing so. But yeah, um, so I'm gonna slowly try to bring that Leonard Cohen uh, song yeah. back, and I realize that you have the exact same last name. Um, well. <laughs> um, so democracy in America, which uh, I I believe is is held on two pillars, of course, uh, civil and political liberty, as well as um, uh, well, so far, uh, formal equal rights and equal opportunity. Um, yeah. If you're a Republican, you would probably prioritize the liberty column, and if yeah. you're a Democrat, you would prioritize the the other one. Uh, of course, I, I I think of that Milton Friedman quote: uh, "Was that if you uh, if you choose to increase equality uh, over liberty, you would end up with neither. If you choose to increase yeah. liberty over equality, you would end up with a great deal of both." Um, um, so I, I happen to actually agree with that statement, uh, and, and um, I'm sure that I'm sure that you may find some disagreements with it. Uh, so um, I, I would like you to perhaps convince me and the listeners uh, who may who yeah I, I think that a good deal of them are American. Um, why is it that? economic equality should be, I, I guess, should be <clears throat> included in the framework of formal equality and economic opportunity, equal economic opportunity that we, the US is currently having right now. And how can you do that without sacrificing the civil and political liberties that, that the US currently has? Yeah. Um, it's a very important question. And I, I wanna go back to um, the ideas that we were talking about earlier, including that um, uh, statement that you said that uh, Sand Michael Sandel makes in the course, uh, the justice course, where he talks about Rawls and why the view is, his view is so important because it promises, as Rawls says, uh, it proposes, promises is putting it the wrong way. It proposes what Rawls describes as a reconciliation of liberty and equality. <clears throat> so Milton Friedman says you can be a liberal or you can be an egalitarian. You can't be, be both. Yeah. You can't be both. And Rawls says, no, you can be both. Uh, and Rawls is both. I mean, Rawls was uh, Commit as first principle is this principle of equal basic liberties, including uh, political liberty and religious liberty and liberty of the person, liberties associated with the rule of law. Um, but he also was uh, an egalitarian. And, and the issue, part of the issue here is what exactly do you mean by an egalitarian? 
So let's go back to that, the Rawlsian principle, um, not his first principle, the equal basic liberty principle, but the second principle. So he had, has these two components. He says there needs to be fair equality of opportunity. And then you've got the difference principle. Mm -hmm. Now, fair equality of opportunity, um, the, the idea there is that if, you, your talents are the same as mine and what you want to do with your life is the same as mine, but you have much greater chances to succeed because of uh, the circumstance. You're born into a rich family. I'm born into a poor family. You're born into a rich family. There is a fundamental difference at birth, and that may give you greater chances in life than me. We're all six, well, that's unfair. That's a violation of fair equality of opportunity. So it's fundamental unfairness there. I'm not being treated as an equal. And then you think about ways that you can try to uh, address that, that uh, uh, inequality by investing in education and training and like that, 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 try to, that try to equalize chances for people who are similarly talented, similarly able and similarly motivated. And then with the difference principle, you know, it's, as you said, at the very early on in the conversation, Rawls's principle of distributive justice doesn't say that everybody should have the same. It's a principle about what, what kinds of inequalities are permissible. And the, the principle says that uh, inequalities are fine, maybe even valuable, they contribute to uh, economic development, inequalities are fine, so long as they maximally contribute to the well-being of people who are in the least advantaged group. Now, what I don't understand is how exactly uh, efforts to satisfy those requirements of fair equality of opportunity or the difference principle as a principle of distributed justice, I don't, I guess I don't really understand how they are destructive of liberty. I don't understand how they're destructive of democracy to go back to the Leonard Cohen song. They don't seem destructive of democracy at all. In fact, quite to the contrary, unbounded inequality does seem destructive of uh, democracy because economic inequalities translate into political inequalities. So I understand how it's destructive, but I don't understand. I, I, I've never really quite gotten this about how the, the, that combination of fair equality of opportunity and difference, I don't get how that's supposed to be destructive of uh, liberty. Now, I think what happens is when people say that a commitment to equality is destructive of liberty, they stop talking about the specifics about fair equality of opportunity and the difference principle. And they start getting, they encourage you to think that everybody has to be in exactly the same situation. No inequalities at all. Well, that's not, uh, that's certainly not Rawls's view. It's not my view. I don't know if it's anybody's view. Um, but it's, that's the view, you know, you're going to start checking. Do you have a little more than me? Well, we got to take from you to give to me. Oh, no, but now yeah, I got more than you're going to take. We got to control, observe, monitor, check up on every move that everybody is making to make sure that nobody ever is off. Well, I understand how that's destructive of liberty, but, but that's a preposterous view that no one has ever held. So I, I don't get the, I, I don't quite get the problem. Uh, maybe that's my, maybe I haven't thought about it hard enough. Uh, gotcha. So, yeah. uh, final question. Um, again, this is uh, the yeah. democracy song again. There's that, yeah. it's obviously a um, really well written and brilliant protest political song. And there's that line that is repeated democracy is coming to the USA, which is, you know, tongue in cheek. And in that song, uh, Leonard Cohen mentions the, was it from those nights in Tiananmen Square, and we, we both know what that is and what the Chinese government is hiding from the Chinese people about what those events were. And yeah. 
perhaps the equivalent of Tiananmen Square in the 2020s would be what happened in Hong Kong. And from the footage that I've seen, the protesters, they held up the American flag as a symbol of you know, what they want, which is democracy. Yeah. So even now, I, I think that Vietnamese people who are more democratically oriented, like myself, would hold up America as a model of democracy. Nevertheless, um, the US, even though it is a democracy, has not been a perfect one. Yes. And yeah. perhaps uh, the, my final question is, how would you, uh, how would you look at those uh, Leonard Cohen lyrics, assuming that you've listened to the song over and over again, and, and perhaps uh, in general, what does the word democracy mean to you? Um, well, uh, democracy is coming to America, I, I hope so. I mean, America, the country has a great democratic tradition and which I very strongly uh, identify with and, and and not just with the democratic tradition i identify with the country i'm uh, unembarrassed uh, have unembarrassed patriotic uh, sentiments uh, i think you have to love your country in order to want to change it if you don't love it you don't care then you don't care about it uh, enough to uh, try to improve it um I think it's a time of great uh, peril for democracy in the United States. Um, and I think that's a, it's a terrible, it's a terribly sad thing. It's the great achievement of the country and it's a, and it has provided a model for people in other places, as you mentioned, Hong Kong or maybe your uh, people in, uh, in Vietnam. And uh, I think the, I, the idea of democracy is that, if I can put it this way, ordinary people, people have the capacity uh, for uh, self-government. They don't need to be bossed around or told what to do by you know, supreme authorities, whether those authorities are religious or secular, uh, but that they have the capacity, the, the, uh, the sense of justice and the good sense uh, to figure out how to make fundamental decisions of, uh, as equals about how the uh, their collective affairs are going to be uh, regulated and governed. It's a very, historically, I mean, it's a very radical idea. I mean, it's not unique to the United States, the idea, but that's the idea of democracy. It's a very radical idea, the idea of popular self-government, popular self-government among equals. But it's also uh, a, uh, it's, it's a fragile idea. I've written a paper recently about uh, roles and the fragility of democracy. Um, and so it's an idea that uh, every generation needs to, to fight for. Uh, it's not something that you can take for, take for granted. Um, and I, I think there are serious threats to democracy in the United States. And I think that would be, a, it's a terrible thing for the country. And I think it's ter a terrible thing because it's for the reasons that you gave that it, it's provided a model, an aspirational model for people in uh, other places. And I think it would send, uh, the, the message that it would send is uh, a message to people who don't accept the democratic idea um, that, you know they're on the right, so to speak, on the right side of uh, on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's how Lincoln thought about the Civil War in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, it was a, he said it was a country. The United States was a country conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
uh, now we're engaged in a great civil war, which is testing whether any nation, any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And that's how he thought about the stakes. It wasn't the stakes were in the civil war in the United States were not only, oh, that was very important, not only about uh, democracy in the United States, he thought the stakes were about the viability of the democratic promise any place that if this fell apart in the United States, that it would say that, that a place that was so conceived and so dedicated, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that everybody's created equal, that it couldn't long uh, endure. So that's that those are pretty large, uh, pretty large stakes. So uh, I hope democracy, I hope a stronger democracy is coming to America. Um, and if a stronger democracy isn't coming, at least I hope we keep the one that we got. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Two cheers for democracy, wrote Ian Forster. Yeah. yeah. So Joshua Cohen, uh, thank you for your thoughts and opinion and for appearing on this show. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really been a pleasure. And I do hope you come to San Francisco sometime. I'd be happy to see you here. Yeah, I hope so too. Take care.